Hi, I'm Whitney Rose, and I am one of the substitute teaching leaders for our class this year. I'm happy to be with you guys this week after hopefully you all had safe and happy Thanksgivings last week. Before we get started with our lecture this morning, um, I have a couple of announcements. Today is our final day of our Abraham mini study. So if you've been joining us for that, we hope that you have enjoyed your time with us. If you want to register to finish the remainder of Genesis with us, we would love for you to do that. And the way for you to do that is to contact Melissa Dennis, and her phone number is on the screen. Just give her a call. She'll get your information and get you set up so that you can finish out Genesis with us. And I know we just finished Thanksgiving last week, but we need to talk about Christmas break. We have this week and next week, and then we go on Christmas break for about a month. Um, we will resume doing Zoom discussions on January 6th. So we have two more weeks, and then you have a Christmas break, and then we will all come back in 2021. Before we get started, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for how faithful you are to us, and that you're always with us, and that you constantly reveal yourself to us through your word, um, through these passages that we read, uh, through the examples of these people in the Bible, and um, you just prove yourself to us over and over as the promise keeper, um, as the almighty God, the God who knows everything. And I pray right now that my words will be your words um, straight to the women that are listening and that you will speak um, to their hearts as they hear this message. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever delegated a task or assignment to someone else? Maybe it's something that you're not the greatest at or something that you just don't really like doing on your own. I once asked a close friend to make some baby bedding for me. I couldn't find what I wanted and I didn't want to settle on something that I was going to have to look at every day for some time. Now I can't sew. But I had a friend who was very talented at sewing. So I asked her if she would make this baby bedding for me. She gladly accepted the challenge. She told me how much fabric to buy and she promised me that she would do her very best to create what I wanted. So I chose my fabrics, handed them off to her. In the beginning stages of the project, she asked me a lot of questions. Questions like, what kind of trim, what kind of borders, how long I wanted ribbons, how fluffy I wanted things to be. I had no knowledge or skill to be able to effectively answer these questions. So she heard me say a lot, I don't really know, but I trust you. And I did trust her. I had seen her work before. I knew that she was perfectly capable of making those decisions and completing the project. I knew that she had the skill to do what was needed to produce a beautiful product. I chose her and put my trust in her to do this project because I knew she had what it took to do it. I didn't ask my mom to make this bedding for me. I love my mom and if I need a hem, she's the gal I go to, but I know that for this, she did not have the skill or knowledge to do this particular project. In the end, my friend created me the most beautiful baby bedding that was exactly what I hoped it would be. I placed my trust in my friend instead of anyone else because I already knew that she had the ability to fulfill her promise. And we see in our text today that Abraham and Sarah could trust God to fulfill his promises because they already knew that he alone had the power and the knowledge to be able to do so. And still today, we trust in God's promises because we know who he is. God's promises can be trusted because they reside in his character. We're gonna look at today's text in two divisions. The first division is going to be Almighty God with Abraham, and that's Genesis chapter 17. And then the second division will be Omniscient God Sees Sarah. And that will be Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. Now, before we look at our text for today, 
let's remember Abram's journey up until this point so we can get a better handle of where he is. Abram was 75 years old when God called him and established his covenant with Abram, promising to make him into a great nation, to make Abram's name great, and to bless all peoples on the earth through him. God expected Abram to respond to this call by leaving everything to go to an unknown land, and Abram obeyed. But we also saw that Abram's obedience wasn't perfect. Circumstances overwhelmed Abram, and he took things into his own hands, putting himself and his wife at risk in Egypt. Still, God intervened, and Abram continued walking faithfully in obedience to God. Abram demonstrated his faith in God by deferring the choice of land to his nephew Lot in order to resolve conflict. This decision led to Lot's capture during war and his rescue by Abram. Following Abram's selfless act to save his nephew, God appeared to Abram in a vision and reaffirmed his covenant. God reminded Abram what he was promised and further demonstrated this through completing a ritual to signify his commitment to the covenant. Despite God's confirmation, Abram and Sarah again took things into their own hands. They lost patience waiting for God's promise to be fulfilled, doubted the physical possibility of Sarah's ability to bear a child, and began to misinterpret how God would fulfill the promise. As an outward sign of their disobedience, at 86 years old, Abram had a son through his wife's Egyptian slave, Hagar. And that brings us to chapter 17, where we see that 13 relatively uneventful years have passed since the birth of Ishmael, and Abram is now 99 years old. There's no record of God appearing or speaking to Abram, it seemed that life had carried on as usual. Abram and Sarai might have believed that they had the heir promised by God in Ishmael, but we will soon see that that is not the case. In verse 1, after 13 years of silence from God, he appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. God revealed himself in a special way to Abram with a new name. God had been acknowledged as El, El, El Elyon, the Most High God, by Melchizedek, El Roy, the God who sees, by Hagar, and as Abram's shield and very great reward. But this revelation of himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty God, was a new name. Why would God choose to reveal himself to Abram as almighty this time? Because God knew that Abram would have to believe that he was almighty, all-sufficient, all-powerful, sovereign over all things in order to trust what he was about to tell him. Believing God is almighty pointed Abram to the promise that nothing is impossible for God. God says, I will, 12 times in this chapter, promising Abram that he alone will do the impossible. Abram knew that God could do the impossible though. He knew that God spoke and created everything out of nothing. He knew that God flooded the earth, but spared Noah and his family along with every kind of creature. He knew that God alone has the power to make the barren fertile. Abram was called to remember what God had done, who he is, and to believe what he will do. Immediately following this revelation, God commanded Abram to walk faithfully before me and be blameless. God did not expect Abram to be sinless. Abram was to continue in faith in God Almighty, continue as a person of integrity, not perfect, but one who walked in faith with God. 
We've already seen that Abram's walk was not perfect. He faltered many times, failing to trust God in hard situations. But God remained with Abram, even in his failures, and grew his faith. It was Abram's faith that made him blameless, just as our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ makes us blameless before a holy God. Abram's response to God was to fall face down before him. Being in the presence of God elicits a physical response as we encounter his power, greatness, and holiness. Abram responded in reverence and awe and postured himself rightfully on the ground, recognizing God's position as above him in all things. This intentional posturing is a practice that we can continue today. Too often, we are too casual with God. Therefore, we do not experience the depth of joy that comes from the full realization of his person and his presence. The spontaneous posture of the body reveals the attitude of the mind. And conversely, the body's posture can influence the mind. When we truly hear God personally speaking to us, the response must be spontaneous, deliberate reverence. Philippians 2.10 says, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. God continued his message to Abram with the words, as for me, indicating this is my part of the covenant between us. He then restated and expanded the covenant between himself and Abram. God refers to the covenant as my covenant nine times in this chapter. What is a covenant? Well, a covenant is an everlasting promise that God makes to help and protect mankind. God Almighty establishes the terms of his covenants. A covenant between God and man is different from covenants or contracts between men because we know that God in his perfect character can and will keep every promise he makes. So this covenant made 23 years prior between God and Abram would come to fruition. Our God keeps his promises, even when it takes decades and centuries, even millennia. God may appear to be slow in promise keeping, but this is only a human perspective. Our understanding of time can never fully realize the vast and infinite power of God. Being reminded that God is the one who established the covenant gave Abram encouragement to continue his walk of faith. It enabled him to trust God to do the impossible. Even today, recognizing God as the promise maker allows us freedom to obey him, follow him, and wait for him to be the promise keeper that we know he is. When God repeated his covenant to Abram this time, he changed his name. Abram means exalted father. And God said, you will now be known as Abraham, which means father of a multitude. In Abraham's culture and time period, a name was very important. A name represented who a person was, carried messages, or told of significant events associated with the person's life. Changing Abram's name to Abraham was a constant reminder to him and those around him of the promise of God. And God then reaffirmed the covenant with Abram. He reminded him that he will be fruitful, have exceeding greatness, that the covenant was everlasting between Abraham and his offspring for generations to come. And of course, the promise of the land. There were a couple of subtle differences when God repeated his promise to Abraham. 
instead of using the singular word nation, like in chapter 12, here, God used the plural form. You will be the father of many nations, and I will make nations of you. Abraham and Sarah's independent plan to produce an heir through Hagar resulted in the birth of Ishmael, whose descendants would become the Arab people. Abraham's descendants also included the Jewish people through Isaac. Eventually, all who trust Jesus Christ as Savior are spiritual children of Abraham. God also included here that the promise would include kings. Galatians 3.8 actually says that in this promise, God announced the gospel in advance to Abraham when he promised that all nations would be blessed through him because God was pointing to Jesus, the King of Kings. Now, in verse 9, God turns to acknowledge Abram's part of the covenant. As for you, every promise must be believed and received. So, Abraham was told to demonstrate his faith in God and his word through circumcision of all the men. And this was to continue for all generations on the eighth day of a boy child's life. This exercise of faith was called a sign that Abraham and others believed what God had told them. We've seen the sign of the rainbow given to Noah, promising that God would never flood the earth again. And later we will be given the sign of baptism, an outward sign to demonstrate our belief in Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah. So here, the sign of circumcision was very appropriate because it was related to the male reproductive organ and, of course, the promise was offspring. And this sign of circumcision signified that if the person did not continue by faith in El Shaddai, he would be cut off and thrown aside, just like that foreskin. This outward sign represented an inward love of God in trust and obedience. Abraham believed God and had been credited as righteous before he was ever circumcised. The sign of circumcision did not cause spiritual regeneration. It testified to it. God's power alone would give Abraham a son, land, and all his promised favor. God asked Abraham, however, to respond in an act of obedience that set him apart from other people. In the same way, God's covenant with us is based completely on what Christ has done for us. We have the privilege of knowing God and living securely by believing his word. But just like Abraham, we are called to lead lives that are set apart. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. While circumcision is no longer a required sign, we are called to circumcision of the heart. Romans 2.29 says, And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. This is an inward change that only God can affect through a spiritual rebirth, a spiritual baptism of grace. And Colossians 2.11, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Our spiritual circumcision is accomplished at conversion by the Spirit of God, in order to allow us to have victory over our old desires and separation from our sin nature. And aside from this one time cutting off of our old self to be born a new creation in Christ, we are called to daily circumcision of the heart. This requires cutting out the areas of our heart where we have replaced God with our own personal idols. I was speaking with Jennifer the other day and she was expressing that she had recognized an unhealthy attachment to her phone and wanted to limit the time that she was spending on it. I realized that her steps to curtail this behavior 
were an obedient response to circumcise her heart, literally cut it out of her life. God had revealed to her the time and energy that her phone was stealing away from doing the things that he has called her to do, and she acted in faith to remove the phone from its position as an idol. We all have areas that God is calling us to cut off. It may be a specific behavior, the way we spend our time. It might be an attitude of pride, jealousy, bitterness. What area of your life is God calling you to circumcise? When called to circumcise his family and household, Abraham obeyed immediately and completely. Verse 23 says, On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God had told him. Will you follow Abraham's example of obedience? Now, backing up just a little bit, in verse 15, God tells Abraham exactly how he is going to fulfill this covenant promise through Sarai. Like Abraham, God gave Sarai a new name, Sarah with an H. Sarah is the only woman in scripture whose name was changed. The names Sarai and Sarah have the same meaning, princess. So this change isn't signifying a change in character. Sarai, like Abram, signified the past. And Sarah, like Abraham, signified what God would do in the future. After he gave Sarah her new name, God clearly and completely laid out the details of how he would fulfill his promise of an heir through Abraham. God knew Abraham and Sarah's difficulty in waiting for fulfillment of this promise, and he saw them act impatiently, trying to make the promise happen in a way they saw as humanly possible through Hagar. So, in his great grace and love for them, God lays out the plan. Verse 16, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. At this point, Abraham fell face down and laughed at the proposition that a man and woman well beyond childbearing years would have a son. This laugh was not one of doubt, but one of overwhelming joy at the thought of the impossible being made possible. Have you ever received great news or experienced something that made you so happy all you could do was laugh? I think this is what Abraham was expressing. He laughed in joyous amazement as he contemplated what seemed too good to be true. But in that same moment, his thoughts go to his son Ishmael. Abraham loved Ishmael dearly and had been investing in him for the past 13 years. What would this mean for his future? God patiently and gently continues to reveal the plan to Abraham that Sarah will bear a son to be named Isaac and that the everlasting covenant would be established through him. The name Isaac means he laughs. And there are three times that laughter is associated with Isaac's birth. The first is when God reveals that Sarah will bear a son, Abraham laughs. The second time when Sarah hears that she will bear a son, she laughs in unbelief. And the third time, when Isaac is born, Sarah laughs again, but this time with joy. Ishmael's name means God hears. So God's response to Abraham, Abraham's concern for Ishmael reminded him that God has already promised blessing upon Ishmael. Ishmael will be greatly blessed and will have 12 sons. But Ishmael also represented Abraham and Sarah's fleshly, sinful attempts to produce an heir. God knew that the covenant promise and the descendants who would eventually end in the Messiah would be exclusively through Isaac, the miraculously God-given child of promise. And then God even said when this will happen. In verse 21, 
by this time next year. So Abraham, who's been waiting 24 years to see God's promise fulfill, responded in faith and complete belief in what God had said. God left Abraham and immediately Abraham returned to his home and obeyed the command to circumcise his entire household. God's revelation to Abraham showed him that God's promises are not carried out by man's strength, power, or any action that we take. God's promises can be trusted and will be fulfilled only by the power of the Almighty God. And that's our first truth for today. The promises of God can be believed because they reside in the power of the Almighty God. The promises of God can be believed because they reside in the power of the Almighty God. What promise are you waiting for God to fulfill in your life? This is really a loaded question when you think about it. What are the promises that God makes to us? We must go back to his word to see in order to ensure that we are not creating our own God promises. God promises to be with us always. He promises to give us wisdom. He promises that we are his children. He promises eternal life, new life in him, to make a way for us, to help us when we are tempted. These are just a few, but they are powerful. Life is hard. We face challenges every day. Challenges with our health, our relationships, our finances, our jobs, even challenges with ourselves. And people will fail us. There will be times when we feel alone, abandoned, betrayed, and hopeless. It's in these times we must look to the promises of God. The same God who fulfilled the covenant promises he made to Abraham can and will fulfill the promises he has made with us. It may not be in our way or our time, but we can trust that he is at work for our good. He can be trusted and his promises can be believed because he alone has the unlimited power, unlimited knowledge, and unlimited resources to make them happen. In chapter 18, three visitors appeared to Abraham. The text tells us in verse 1 that one of these visitors was the Lord himself. It is thought the pre-incarnate Christ. This means that this was God the Son showing himself on earth before he was born to Mary as human Jesus. This is known as a Christophany. Abraham must have realized that these were not just three ordinary travelers passing by. And you can see this in the way he responded to their presence. Abraham, a man of stature and means, rushed out to the visitors and bowed low to the ground before them. He humbled himself and offered to serve them personally. Abraham rushed around recruiting the help of Sarah, gathering water and food, preparing a feast fit for a king. Abraham requested three seas of flour, which was equivalent to 20 quarts, and he prepared an entire animal. This was clearly a banquet appropriate for royalty. Abraham's service to his visitors was an act of worship. His heart desired to serve the Lord, to give his best. There was no fear for Abraham in the presence of the Lord, only love, respect, and honor. Abraham truly had a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. In fact, the book of James tells us that Abraham was even called God's friend. Once the men finished eating, they got down to the business of this divine encounter. The Lord was there for Sarah. Abraham had already re received the message of the promised heir named Isaac. And now it was Sarah's turn to hear directly from the mouth of the Lord that she would in fact bear a son to Abraham. Where is Sarah? They asked in verse 9. God knew that Sarah was nearby. God knew that she was listening, but he called out her new name 
in order to gain her complete attention. He continued by repeating the same message that about the same time next year, Sarah would have a son. Sarah's response of laughter was not one of overwhelming joy, but one of doubt and ridicule. In Sarah's mind, all she could think was her age, her husband's age, the years spent waiting and trying without success. And now, now God wants to grant her the pleasure of a child? Sarah thought her silent laugh went unheard, but was confronted with the power of the all-knowing God who knows not only every word we speak, but every thought in our heart. Why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can you imagine the look on Sarah's face as she is confronted with her disbelief? Her heart must have been pounding within her chest and sweat forming in the palm of her hands. This is no ordinary guest, Sarah. This is the omniscient God who knows you. He knows your inner thoughts. He hears your inner laugh. And this God will cause you to have a son because not only does he know all things, he has control of all things. Abraham may be 100 and you may be 90, but this miracle is not too hard for the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient God. When Sarah was confronted with her secret, she responded in fear with a lie. But God made it clear that he knew her heart. He knew the truth. The Lord's rebuke removed Sarah's unbelief and created the true faith in his word that she needed in order to conceive. Sarah's doubt seems like a failure, but we already know that despite past failures and present doubts, God doesn't abandon his promises to Sarah and Abraham. He does fulfill his promise to bring the rightful heir to the covenant promises through Sarah and baby Isaac. And we'll get to discuss that part of the story. But now I want to leave you with another truth from this lesson, that the promises of God can be believed because he is the God who knows everything. The promises of God can be believed because he is the God who knows everything. Where are you doubting God? Is there a situation in your life that seems impossible? A circumstance where you just keep hitting dead ends and you feel at the end of your rope and you've lost hope that even God can solve the problem? It's so easy to doubt God, to doubt that he is all powerful, all knowing, and that nothing is too hard for him to accomplish. But God knows everything about you. He knows your needs, desires, motives, strengths, and weaknesses. He knows what is best for you. His omniscience gives him the perfect perspective and ability to fulfill every promise that he has made in just the right time and in just the right way. And let us remember that this same God who gave a child to a woman beyond menopause centuries later would completely fill, fulfill the covenant promise made to Abraham through the birth of Jesus to a virgin in Nazareth. Nothing is impossible for those in covenantal fellowship with the Lord. If something is willed of God, it cannot be prevented. God comes to us today through his word. He creates new life within us as we choose to believe that what Christ accomplished on the cross is for us personally. Through faith in Christ, God sweeps away the old life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. As we read the Bible, God continues to remove doubts and prepare us to believe that he will do the impossible, that his promises can be trusted because he is almighty and he knows everything. How has God come to you this week as you studied this passage? Is he forming your faith in his son who will create in you new life through his spirit? What impossible thing might he accomplish through you as you trust him? Let's pray. Father, we do just thank you for your word. 
Thank you for who you are, the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God who sees us and knows every need and every desire of our heart. God, I pray that we do trust you more and more each day as we know you more and as we draw closer to you. Thank you for being our personal loving God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.